Hola, and welcome to Spanish Answers, a podcast that gives you unas llavitas claves as you unlock your Spanish language adventure. I'm your host, Sarah, with Language Answers, and today in episode 60, we'll continue our three-part series on animals, baby animals, and more. First, I would like to apologize for how late this episode is. We have been dealing with a series of family crises, and it has been a really hard time. So I appreciate your patience with this. Um, It has just taken a while as we work through all those things. So again, thank you so much for being patient with me on this. I really appreciate it. So in episode 59, we talked about pets and parks slash outdoor animals, and today we're going to focus on wild animals and those that you'd find on the farm. So let's get started. One thing to note from last episode, in Spanish, you can say cria to refer to a baby animal, which, as I understand it, is more common than saying bebe. So if you don't know if there is a specific term for a baby animal, you can just say cria, like cria de ave, baby bird or chick, or cria de tortuga, baby turtle or hatchling. Also, I messed up in last week's blog slash podcast. I said a duckling in Spanish was pavipollo o Pavesno, but those are actually terms for baby turkey or polt. I'm not sure why, but I have been struggling with mixing up turkey and duck. Completely different animals, I know. But there it is. Anyways, I wanted to let you know, duckling is actually el patito or anadon, since anade means duck as well. But now that we've fixed those errors, let's go ahead and start with farm animals also known as los animales de la granja. Now, if you have a little one that you enjoy reading to, then you're probably very familiar with farm animals. A lot of the books we read to our little one focus on farm animals. I was confused about it at first until I realized how much she loves seeing real live horses and goats. Now, it all makes sense. So let's go ahead and start with the list. We have el caballo, which is horse, El caballo, horse, and it's foal, which in Spanish we'd say el potrillo. Foal or el potrillo. And just like in English, horses have special names based on their sex, age, and reproductive state. For example, a gelding, a castrated adult male horse, is called un caballo capón or un caballo castrado. And a stallion, an adult male horse that isn't castrated, is called un cemental or un garañón. A mare, an adult female horse, is called una yegua. And I have included a link if you'd like to research more special names for horses, of course. Anyways, carrying on. La vaca, or cow. La vaca, cow. And its baby is called a calf, or el ternero. Or you could say becerro. El ternero, or el becerro. And one thing to note here is that una vaca refers to a female cow, but if you were to refer to a male cow, a bull, it's called un toro. Un toro. Which reminds me of the song Torero by Cheyenne, and if you haven't heard it, you should definitely check it out. So I will, of course, include a link to the YouTube video for that song in the show notes. Anyways, la oveja is sheep. La oveja is sheep. And el cordero, or lechazo, means lamb. El cordero, or lechazo, means lamb. La gallina is the chicken. La gallina is the chicken. And el pollito, or polluelo. Pollito, or polluelo. And that's both words use the double L for the yo sound. Pollito, or polluelo, is the chick. And of course, a rooster would be called un gallo. Un gallo. El cerdo is pig. El cerdo is pig. And el lechón, with an accent mark over the O, is piglet. El lechón is piglet. La llama is llama. La llama, llama. Y la cría de llama is the baby llama, which, ironically enough, in English we call a cría. So la cría de llama is the same as cría, or baby llama. El pavo is turkey. 
El pavo is turkey, and we've already talked about how the polt, or the baby turkey, is called pavipollo or pavesno. Pavipollo or pavesno. Now, you may have noticed that this is also a more common ending, this easy N-O, pavesno, because we have pavesno, right, polt, but we also have lobesno, which is wolf pup, and osesno, which is bear cub. So it's an interesting, interesting ending. And if anyone knows anything about why that is, please let me know because I am curious. Anyways, la alpaca, the alpaca, la alpaca, alpaca. And we would call its baby a calf, but in Spanish it's just la cria de alpaca, la cria de alpaca, or calf. Finally, we have la cabra, which is goat, la cabra, which is goat, and its kid is el chivo, el chivo, or kid. Next, let's talk about los animales salvajes, or wild animals. So we have el tigre, which is the tiger, el tigre, or tiger, and you would say cachorro de tigre, cachorro de tigre, to talk about its cub or whelp. The elephant, or elefante, the elephant, or elefante, and its calf, or elefante bebé, or cria de elefante. You really can say it either way, elefante bebé or cria de elefante. We have the peaceful dove, la paloma. La paloma, which just sounds peaceful, dove. And its squab or chick is called el pichon. El pichon, and that's with an accent mark over the O. We have dolphin or el delfín. El delfín, with an accent over that I, and a baby dolphin would be el delfinato, el delfinato, or calf, in English, right, calf. We have the eagle, or el águila, el águila, and you have an accent over that first A, or accent mark over that first A, el águila, eagle, and while in Spanish they would say la cría de águila, la cría de águila, in English, we say eaglet or fledgling, eaglet or fledgling. And one really interesting thing to note about this word, eagle in Spanish, el águila, is technically feminine, but it uses the masculine article. So why? Why does it do this? Because the word starts with a stressed a, águila. So in Spanish, this means it must use the masculine article, el, even though it is a feminine noun. This is true, for example, el agua, which is why you'll hear people say agua fresca instead of agua fresco. It's a feminine noun. I know, mind blown. Anyways, el alma follows the same rule. So you would say un alma gemela, soulmate or literally twin soul, instead of un alma gemelo. Pretty cool. Next we have frog or la rana, frog or la rana. And in Spanish, it's just la cría de rana, la cría de rana. But in English, we have pollywog, tadpole, and froglet. Pollywog, tadpole, and froglet. Which kind of makes sense now why they named a Pokemon Pollywag, right? Don't worry, I included a link to it for all my fellow Pokemon fans. Anyways, giraffe is la jirafa. Giraffe is la jirafa. And its calf would be el ternero de jirafa. Calf is el ternero de jirafa. Now, a gorilla or monkey, el gorila or el mono, gorilla or monkey, el gorila or el mono. In English, we say infant as a baby monkey or gorilla. Kind of creepy, I know. But in Spanish, it would be la cría de gorilla or la cría de mono. So infant is la cría de gorilla or la cría de mono. A shark or el tiburón with an accent over the O, shark or el tiburón has a baby that we call a pup or la cría de tiburón, la cría de tiburón or pup. Zebra or la cebra, zebra or la cebra has a foal, which in Spanish we'd say el potrillo, el potrillo. The hippopotamus, or el hippopotamo, with an accent over that second O, el hippopotamo, hippopotamus. We would say calf in English, but in Spanish it's just la cría de hippopotamo, la cría de hippopotamo. 
and kangaroo and koala all also use cria. So kanguro, el kanguro is kangaroo. El koala is koala, right? El koala, koala. Both use cria, but in English, they both are called joey. Well, their babies are called a joey. A Komodo dragon or el dragon de Komodo. Komodo dragon or el dragon de Komodo uses cria as well. But in English, it's a hatchling. So, cria in Spanish, cri la cria de dragón de Komodo, quite a mouthful, or hatchling. Bear with me, we're almost done with the list. This one is quite long. So, we have a lion, or el león. Lion, or el león, with an accent over the O. And its cub would be el leoncillo. El leoncillo, or cub. And a lioness, of course, is una leona. Una leona. A whale is la ballena, whale is la ballena, and its calf is el ballenato, el ballenato, calf. We have el pulpo, octopus, el pulpo, octopus, and its cria, or fry, la cria de pulpo, or fry, which is hilarious in English that we chose that as a baby octopus. Anyways, el oso gigante or oso panda is, of course, a giant panda or panda bear. El oso gigante or oso panda, and its cub is el osesno, just like bear cub. So, cub or el osesno. Penguin is el pinguino with an umlaut over the U, those two dots. So, el pinguino or penguin, and it's just la cria de pinguino or chick. La cria de pinguino or chick. Now, these last two also just use cria for the baby word. So we have peacock or el pavo real, peacock or el pavo real, which translates literally as royal turkey, which is, oh, that's amazing. Anyways, el pavo real, peacock, and pichic is la cria de pavo real, pichic. And then a seahorse is el caballito de mar. So it's like a little tiny horse of the ocean or of the sea. Seahorse, el caballito de mar, and its sea foal is in Spanish just la cria de caballito de mar. Quite a mouthful, but sea foal, la cria de caballito de mar. Whew, so there you have it. There is our complete list of, well, obviously this is not an all-inclusive list. There are many more animals, so please let me know what your favorite animal is and what your favorite baby animal name is because there are so many good ones out there can tell me in Spanish or English, I would love to know. Anyways, we will move on now to our cultural tip of Peru. All right, so today's cultural tip on Peru covers its national holidays. To save on time and to avoid extreme repetitiveness, Here's a quick list of holidays that many other countries also celebrate and or which we have covered in other episodes, so I won't get into too much detail for these ones, although I have included some interesting tidbits for further context or unique ways they celebrate in Peru. There is New Year's Day, which is always celebrated on January 1st. There's Maundy Thursday and Good Friday, which are always celebrated on the Thursday and Friday before Easter, so this year it was April 1st and April 2nd. There's Labor Day, which is May 1st or Dia del Trabajador. There's St. Peter and St. Paul's Day, which is June 29th. And if you'd like more information on this holiday, go ahead and check out episode 46. There is All Saints Day, which is November 1st, or Dia de Todos los Santos, or All Hallows Day. Now, this day commemorates all Christian saints. So for Catholics, they celebrate by going to Mass. Then on, then of course, there's Christmas Day, which is December 25th. And this is a Saturday, so they, in Peru, they'll be getting the following Monday off, December 27th. The Immaculate Conception is December 8th, or Immaculada Concepcion. I don't know that we've ever talked about this one, but it is a popular holiday in Catholic nations. It celebrates the conception of Mary, the mother of Jesus. So it's called Immaculada because in the Catholic Church, it is taught that Mary was born immaculate or without original sin. Full transparency. I'm Protestant, so I do not agree with this. Anyways, let's talk about four of their unique national holidays. The first is Fiesta del Inti Raimi, or just Inti Raimi. 
which happens on June 24th. This is an Incan festival, which celebrates the winter solstice by honoring the Incan sun god, Inti. It also begins the Incan New Year. While the true solstice is on June 21st, the day is celebrated on the 24th due to the Catholic influence and St. John's Day, which is also celebrated on June 24th. Now, initially, this ceremony was the most important one of four major Incan ceremonies celebrated in the capital, Cusco. It involved dancing, processions, chicha, you know, their version of beer, the burning and reading of coca leaves, and it lasted nine days. Quite the party. Alarmingly, this celebration also included a procession of mummies, their ancestors wrapped up from nearby temples, and as many as 20,000 llama sacrifices. Even worse, they would sacrifice children under the age of 10 and would predict the future with their organs. Absolutely horrifying. Now, while this was banned in 1535 by the Spanish, it was revived in 1944 and has been celebrated in Peru ever since. But no worries, there are no sacrifices these days. There are, however, indigenous crafts, food, and dancing in traditional colorful outfits. They have singing and traditional instruments, speeches, including in Chechuan, and reenactments. Basically, it is now a cultural celebration of the Incan heritage, as well as a bit of a tourist attraction. And it all takes place in just one day. So you can see more by clicking on the videos in the links I've included in the show notes. And it is quite the colorful celebration. The second holiday is their Independence Day, which is celebrated on July 28th through the 29th. Similar to how in episode 58, where we talked about Chile's Fiestas Patrias, Peru also celebrates their own Fiestas Patrias on July 28th. It celebrates Peru's declared independence from Spain in 1821 by the Argentinian commander, Jose San Martin. So how is it celebrated? Well, on the evening before, July 27th, they will play folk music in parks and plazas across the country. Then on the 28th, they will have 21 gun salutes in Lima, as well as a flag raising ceremony. The holiday covers two days, so then on the next day, they have a military parade and celebrate the armed forces and the national police. Now. Normally, this happens on the 29th, but sometimes it might be a bridge holiday on the Monday before the 28th. That is, if it falls on a Tuesday. Then there is the Santa Rosa de Lima on August 30th. This day is dedicated to celebrating Saint Rose of Lima, or I guess in English I should say Lima, who is the patron saint of Peru as well as the indigenous people of Latin America. Born to a Spanish father and an indigenous mother on April 20th, 1586, Isabel was one of 13 children. She had such rosy cheeks that she was called Rose. Now, she came from a very poor family, so despite her dedication to God, she could not join a monastery. Instead, she worked out of a small cottage to support her family and her charity work, selling flowers and needlework and help the sick and needy of Lima. The Dominican order took note and let her join them without having to pay. So she was pretty amazing. She was also a bit extreme in her religious practices, According to officeholidays.com, this included, quote, eating only bread and water and wearing a spiked crown under her waist under her clothes, unquote. Yeah, extreme devotion. Now, she died on August 24th, 1617, and her funeral had to be delayed by two days because so many people wanted to pay their respects. She was the first Latin American born person to be beatified in 1667, with her feast day added to the Catholic calendar in 1729. Now, since St. Bartholomew's Day already had August 24th, the closest available date to her actual day of death was the 30th. That's why it's celebrated that day instead of the day she actually died. Now, how do Peruvians celebrate? There is a procession from the church where her remains are to Lima's cathedral. People will also visit the church and sanctuary of St. Rose of Lima. Lastly, we have the Battle of Angamos, which happens on October 8th. This day marks the, obviously, Battle of Angamos, or El Combate Naval de Angamos, which was fought during the War of the Pacific, or the Saltpeter War, between Chile and Bolivia for control over the Atacama Desert and its minerals. Now, because of a secret agreement between Bolivia and Peru, Peru got dragged into the war. The Battle of Angamos took place on October 8, 1879, between the Peruvian and Chilean navies. Chile captured the Peruvian warship Huascar and killed Admiral Miguel Grau Seminario. So while Peru lost in a key battle, they consider Admiral Grau a hero and celebrate the Peruvian Navy's heroism in this battle. They also hold military and civil parades to honor Admiral Grau. Well, that's
that's all for today. Thank you so much for listening, and don't forget to check out the show notes for links to the resources I used for this episode. If you would prefer to read an approximate transcription of today's episode, you can also visit the episode's blog. I would love to help you on your Spanish journey, so if you have any questions about Spanish culture or grammar, or if you need a Spanish to English translator or language consultant, you can reach me at contact at languageanswers.com or visit my website for more information at www.languageanswers.com. Remember, learning a language is a lifelong journey. Aprovechalo, disfrútalo y compártelo. See you in two weeks. Hasta luego.